Hi there, and welcome to another Scratch tutorial, this time focusing on HDR workflows. This tutorial is going to be split up into three chapters. First of all, how to set up your project. Next, grading and color space management. And lastly, rendering and mastering HDR content, plus the workflows that are connected to this. So, let's have a look at how to set up our project. HDR mastering requires us to deliver HDR-specific metadata along with a deliverable. Particularly, this means info about the grading environment, your reference screen so to speak, and the final content. So we've added this HDR mastering section to the project settings. The data we fill in here is used in different ways. First of all, it is included in the HDMI signal that is being sent to your monitor. Certain professional displays can read this info and jump into a specific mode. Others will just ignore it. Secondly, all the data here serves as a default for the HDR metadata on each output node in Scratch. When rendering HDR, it is important to include mastering and luminance settings with the actual content, so that when viewing the rendered content on a different system, it can be properly interpreted. Now HDR is mostly being mastered in either Rec 2020 or P3 color space. As you can see on this image, a color space is always defined by its RGB primaries forming a triangle. The primaries in turn get defined by the individual X and Y coordinates displayed here. Same applies for the white point of a color space. It also has its own X and Y coordinates. You can select presets here or define your own custom primaries and also choose the transfer function, the so-called EOTF that is being sent to your monitor through the HDMI output of your video I.O. card. The EOTF basically tells what type of gamma curve is applied. Next, we have the minimum and maximum luminance parameters. These define our mastering levels. So while I leave the minimum luminance at 0 nits, I know that we will be mastering our content for 1000 nits, so I'll set the maximum luminance to 1000. At the same time, this will indicate the reference nit level at 1000 nits on our scopes inside Scratch. Next to the static metadata here, we also have dynamic metadata that depends on the media you're working on. MaxCLL defines the brightest pixel of our whole program and MaxFall defines the average light level throughout the whole program. Their actual values can only be determined after you've finished grading your media. We will see later how to calculate those values in Scratch. For now, you can just enter reference values, which as said are included in the HDMI signal and are used by certain professional displays, for example in order to warn you if you exceed any of those levels. Before starting your grade, you should set up your color management. Color management in Scratch is very straightforward, as it's a simple input-output game. The input color space is always the source clip's color space. The output color space is either the displays or the exports color space. Now let's first have a look at how to get your input correct. For the sake of demonstration I have disabled color management here, so you see the actual steps manually. So in this timeline I have four different shots. The first one is already in Rec 2020 and is encoded with a PQ curve. Unfortunately, this clip does not ship the metadata to tell Scratch this info so we need to flag it manually to Rec 2020 and PQ. Note the scopes which will jump into HDR mode and show our reference level of 1000 nits once the clip is set to PQ. Next we have a red raw clip which we debarred directly to Rec 2020 and PQ, hence Scratch was able to automatically flag it accordingly. Then we have a Sony raw clip. As the Sony SDK does not offer to debuy to Rec 2020, P3, PQ or the likes, we chose a Gamut and EOTF that came close to what we want, S Gamut 3 Cine and S Log 3. However, in this case we need to tell Scratch manually that it now should not interpret the clip as Log and SDR, but rather as P3, D65 and PQ. Lastly, we have an SDR shot here that we want to bring into the same range as the others. For this we need to nest the clip and set the nest node to P3D65 and PQ in order to invoke a conversion. If we look at the node tree here, we can see that the SDR source clip is being piped into the new node that transforms the content to HDR. 
Now usually you're working with just one type of footage and just need to set the properties for all clips in one go. However, there are many workflows where you indeed have a mixed timeline and need to deal with various different color spaces and gamma curves, hence we're showing a mixed timeline in this tutorial. Now that we've set up our input color spaces, we will set up the output color space for our displays. Therefore, let's go to the monitor menu. Here we can set the color space and EOTF for our interface and preview monitor separately. For our preview, we're using an AJA Kona 4 with Sony's BVM X300 monitor attached to it. We configured the monitor to work with a P3D65 signal in PQ range. If you remember, this is the same data that we also filled into the HDR mastering settings when we've set up our project. Hence, we also configured Scratch to output P3D65 and PQ on the preview output. Our interface monitor, however, is not an HDR screen, but a simple REC709 calibrated computer monitor. Hence, we flagged it as REC709 and SDR, and Scratch puts on the corresponding conversion from the input color space, which is the one from the source clip. Now let me enable color management for the interface monitor. You're now looking at a straight conversion from PQ to SDR. This is likely to cause an overexposed looking image. A much more pleasing conversion can be achieved by simply setting the display to hybrid log gamma, which gives a result suited for both HDR and SDR displays. This way we have now set up individual output transforms for interface and preview monitor. Depending on what the input or source clips color space in EOTF is, Scratch will apply a transform to match the display's color space and EOTF. This is the very same principle on output nodes where we render, which is also the third and last area to look at when it comes to color management. Let's go to the output menu and take a look at the main output node. The main output node also reflects our timeline, and as you can see, right now our timeline is set to P3D65 and PQ. Again, when rendering our timeline, Scratch will compare each clip's color space and EOTF, the input color space and EOTF, so to speak, with the output node's color space and EOTF and apply a transform if necessary. This way, all the different sources will be unified to a single output upon rendering. OK, so let's assume we have graded our timeline and want to render out our work. As said in the previous chapter, the main output node unifies all clips to the selected color space and EOTF. In this case, we have set our main output node to P3D65 and PQ, and want to render a ProRes delivery file. So let's add a ProRes encoder to our main output node. Now we could just go ahead and render our ProRes file with the HDR content inside. However, as we said in the beginning, with HDR you need to deliver the corresponding metadata as well. In order to do so, we need to first calculate max CLL and max fall. For this, we have implemented the HDR tab on each output node. It is pre-filled out with the defaults that we entered into the project settings. By clicking the Calculate button, Scratch will start the process to analyze each and every frame in our timeline. You can monitor the process in the process queue. Once finished, Scratch has written a number of files to the render folder that contain all the HDR metadata. The most important one, however, is the HTML report that automatically opens after Scratch finished the Analyze. This report contains all the metadata required to deliver along with the ProRes file, including snapshots of the frames with the highest max CLL and max fall values in our program. Now with ProRes, there is not yet a standard that describes how to add the HDR metadata to the ProRes file. However, with our HDR report, you can deliver the HTML as a sidecar file alongside with the ProRes file. Note that this report is fully customizable in terms of appearance and content. Now let's have a quick look at our H.264 encoder. In Scratch 8.6, we have enabled it to support even higher resolutions up to 8K and also implemented a 10-bit encoding option that you can find here in the Format Settings tab. For HDR, the minimum required bit depth for a deliverable is 10-bit, so when rendering HDR content, make sure to set the encoder to 10-bit here. Now back to the metadata. Same as with the ProRes export, we can generate an HTML report here. However, as opposed to ProRes, 
For H.264 there is a standardized way to include the HDR metadata in the resulting MP4 file itself. So, to sum it up, for HDR content rendered to ProRes, the sidecar report files are mandatory to be delivered alongside with the ProRes file. For H.264 MP4, the sidecar files are optional, as all the metadata is already included in the MP4 file. Note that you still need to do the calculation prior to exporting the H.264. Lastly, let's talk a bit about versioning. Here, our main output node is set to P3D65 and PQ. However, maybe we want to derive an SDR or HLG version from our PQ-based grade. There's two ways to go about this, and they are pretty much dependent on time and budget. First, we could of course duplicate our timeline by alt-dragging it here in the project tree, set the main output node to Rec709 and SDR, and now regrade shot by shot. This will yield best results, but of course take its time. Another way is to use the built-in color management and create different versions on our original construct in the output menu. Again, our output node here is still set to P3D65 and PQ. If we want to create an SDR version, for example, just add an image node after the main output node, let me call this PQ2SDR, and set it to Rec709 and SDR. Alternatively, add another image node, PQ2HLG, and set the image node to HLG, keeping the P3D65 color space. If we now enter the player with this node, we can adjust the overall look of the timeline, for example by using the curves to adjust the contrast. Back in the outputs menu, we can now attach our H.264 and ProRes encoder to the derived image nodes, which are doing the image transforms. This way we can output SDR and HLG versions from our PQ-based grade. This concludes the tutorial about HDR workflows in Scratch. Hope this was useful to you and see you next time. Bye!